Turn, if you would, tonight to John chapter 14. I am the way. It's a rich, rich test that we, text that we read here tonight. Let's start reading together in verse 1. <clears throat> Lord Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No, brethren, I appreciate Brother Blake's prayer so much tonight because we look out at a world around us that has gone mad in many cases. You look at a world that has lost its way, a nation in which many are te enthusiastically taking the wrong way, the way of licentiousness and unbelief, which is part of what Jesus called the broad way which leads to destruction. Matthew 7 verse 13. That means our friends and our neighbors, our loved ones that are not Christians, not faithful Christians. It means our enemies, our employers, our employees. They are taking the broad way that leads to destruction. You know, my friends, by anybody's definition, I believe our nation is fast becoming a nation of unbelievers. Or as one uh, poll took it several months ago, nons, N-O-N-E-S. Most United States, uh, people in the United States who claim to be Christian, I use that very quotation about it, are floundering around spiritually. You see, uh, see a, a fish out of the water and it flips around. That's what many people are doing. And it reminds me of the millions who dabble in mind-altering drugs. They like the emotional high that, that what they think is Christianity gives them. Oh, they feel so good. But soon they come down to earth and they wake up and they're wallowing around in selfishness and sin. My friends, you and I and those that are listening tonight, what about us? Which way are you and I taking tonight? Are we taking that way that leadeth to destruction or the way of Jesus Christ? Let's look at this passage tonight, John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. The setting was the Lord's, the last night of the Lord's life. How would you like to go through life knowing that someday you're going to die a violent, horrible death and suffer much? And then that day comes upon you. It comes upon you. Look and look and there it's upon you. He faced that last day with courage and love. He and his apostles had to just observe the Lord's Supper. Or rather the Passover in the upper room. And, what, and as they went to that Passover meal, what had they been doing? They had been bickering amongst each other. Well, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? Who will be the greatest? And here the Lord's about to be crucified for them. And what does the Lord do? They're, they're all sitting there kind of like that, in my mind at least. The Lord takes up a towel and a bowl and a pitcher and washes their feet. Something that a slave did, a servant did, when you came in the house back then. Washes their feet. Then the Lord talks to them and he identifies to John and Peter, who his betrayer has been. He talked about him earlier. But now he identifies him, and he tells Judas what you must do, do quickly. And Judas goes off into the night. I've always been fascinated by that verse. <coughs> Judas goes off into the pitch black night. And I think of that moment, and I think of the agony of Jesus at that moment. Here was a man who had appointed an apostle 
who he had given the ability to cast out demons and to preach in his word, who had been with him all those years of his ministry, and he knew what he was doing, and yet he was sorry for it. Great sorrow he had. Psalm 141, verse 9, Even mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Friends, have you ever had a friend turn against you? Some of us preachers were over at Brother Brown's house and we were talking about how friends that turn against you. Here the Lord's friend turned against him. So what does the Lord do? He goes out into the night, Judas does, and then he commands them to love one another. Love one another. And then in the midst of that, Peter asks this question, because Jesus said, I might preface this, Jesus said, I'm going away. He explained to this many times what was going to happen, but they still didn't understand completely. And Peter said, Lord, where are you going? And he answers Peter's question. Then he says, and by the way, Peter, you're going to betray me. Cock will crow three times. Then we get this great and blessed promise, folks. Right in the midst of this agony that should sink into our minds, let not your heart be troubled. The blessed promise, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I've told you. This should have answered all their questions. That should have been it. But it didn't. Let not your heart be troubled. Brethren, we must rise above our earthly troubles to our heavenly hope. We must look beyond what pains and anguish we have in this life and look to something better. Look that goal of heaven and New Testament Christianity, which is the way through Jesus Christ to heaven. John 14, verse 27, the Lord looked at that in this same discussion. He told his apostles, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Who could say that? With what he was about to face. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. My peace I give unto you. John 16, verse 33. Towards the end of that conversation. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you will have peace. Notice. In me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Brethren, how many times, I know many of us have thought about this verse. In this world we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Then we see Thomas's question. Doubting Thomas, but I believe he reflected what a lot of the, of the apostles felt. They were confused. They didn't know what was, they were heartbroken. They didn't know what was going on completely. And he said, Thomas says, Lord, verse 5, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Lord had been with him for three and a half years, and they did not know the way. But what way is he talking about? He's talking about the age-old question, my friends, what happens after we die? You ask someone that. You ask someone in a nursing home, what happens after we die? You ask that person that you work beside every day, what happens after we die? You ask your best friend, friend, what happens after you die? What will happen to you? Over at Ecclesiastes, we see Solomon said, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21, who knows the spirit of the sons of man which goes upward and the spirit of the animal which goes down the earth? But Jesus knows, my friends, Jesus knows and we know, don't we? Jesus Christ would bring victory over death. Where I don't have to wonder, well, when I die, will I be just like a dog? Will I be just dead all over? Will I just be moldering in the grave somewhere? No. Jesus 
brought victory over death. He gave us forgiveness from our sins. What a great blessing that was. It gives us the hope of eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, a great chapter, of course. I guess they're all great. But in verse 54, we see the victory of Jesus' resurrection and of our resurrection. Paul says, For this, for when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, or grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of the law is sin. Is the, sin. the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends that are watching tonight, do you have victory? And I don't mean an emotional, oh, yes, I can jump up and down and praise the Lord. I mean, do you have victory? Have you done what the Lord says to do? Millions tonight may think that they have found heaven on this earth in a form of financial success. In the form of sexual pleasures. In the form of power, prestige, material comforts, even religious experience or academic accomplishments. They've found, oh, they're feeling pretty good right now. Dare we go to the rich man in Luke chapter 12 to see a man who departed from God's way the rich fool. In verse 18, Jesus gives this parable. He says, or tells about the parable where the rich man who sowed and brought in so much, so much abundance, and he thought of himself, and he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to myself, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool! Or as the King James says, Thou fool! This night, your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? My friends, I think about this. People get my age. I'm a little younger than Doug there. But they think about retirement. And they begin to count their pesos and their Deutschmarks and everything else they've got. And they begin to say, well, how will I retire here? What am I going to do? And I think about it. And I think about the rich fool here who think, thought he had everything figured out didn't think about his neighbor. Didn't think about anyone but himself. Maybe God will wake them up some night and say, Time's up. Time's up. It's time to go home. Mark 8, verse 36. Jesus said a good commentary to this parable. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What if we work and we work and we work and we get that seven-bedroom house? We get that, that uh, boat, nothing wrong with boat, nothing wrong with bedroom, bedroom house. We get all that, oh my, we're doing wonderful, but we lose our own soul. What does that bring about? Let's go back to John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus made that great statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. Who is Jesus? My friend, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. This is one of the absolute, I call it absolutist. I don't know if that word's in there. Absolutist statements of the Bible. I remember years ago in New Mexico talking to a friend of mine, a co-worker of mine who was somewhere between a Hindu and a Catholic. I'm not sure, somewhere in there. 
Uh, I really couldn't figure out where he was, but he said, oh, he started talking this and that, and he had, he had been to this, he did this yoga chant, and he did this, that, and I said, well, you know, John 14, verse 6 says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And oh, he had no answer. He just kind of grumbled. I am the way. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. John 8, verse 58. The Jews came to him and said, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Laughing at him. Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, or truly, truly, verily, verily, before Abraham was, I am. They knew what that meant. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Burning bush. I am. Moses said, Who will I say is sent us? Sent me. I am that I am. Tell them that I am is sent. See, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Colossians 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All those things were created, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jehovah's Witness can't get around that passage. And neither can anybody else. Revelation 1 verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And those apostles know for those three and a half years they walked with the Lord, they were walking with God in the flesh. And then I believe it was Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father and that will suffice. The Lord says, haven't you been with me? Haven't you seen me? <coughs> Notice what else Jesus said. I am the way. What I call a declarative, definite statement. Literally, I am the way and there's no other way. That's what got that Hindu Catholic friend of mine because he thought there were many ways. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way. There's no others. Way to what? Oh, I'm the way. What does that mean? I'm the way to the Father, to God. No one comes to the Father except through or by me, verse 6. One of the great verses of the Bible, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is the way to that love of God. Jesus is that way to that father that cares so much for each and every last one of us. My friends, Jesus Christ is a living way. When you pray to the Lord... To God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not praying to a dead saint. Or you're not praying to the Virgin Mary. You're not praying through an angel. You're not praying to an icon or an image that you have to go up and kiss. No, you're praying to the Father through the Son. The living way. Hebrews 10 verse 19 and 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Jews couldn't go beyond that veil. They couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. Only the priest once a year. And a legend has they tied a rope around his waist so if he happened to kill over, they could pull him out. We have that living way. We have access to the Father, the Holy Father, Jesus, the eternal God through Jesus Christ. That way to eternal life is through His Son. But so me tonight, as we mentioned, not taking that way. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. How many tonight think, oh, I know what I'm doing? Yes, I'm doing fine. I'm doing good. I'm involved in this church where we bounce around and we do different things. We jump up and down. We're a real friendly bunch. That may be the wrong way. That may be the way that leads to death. Do I want to take that way or do I want to take the way of life? Jesus Christ is the way. How is he the way? 
by his doctrine and teachings. My friends, that way is straight from God. Did those apostles and those people that heard Jesus by the thousands, did they know that God was speaking to them through Jesus Christ? John 17, verse 7 and 8, when the Lord prayed to the Father the last night of his life, he prayed to the apostles, he says, Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, which we're reading tonight. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. If, you know, my friends, if so many people, and I've heard people say this, well, you know, if God would just speak to me, or God spoke to me last night, which usually was just a, a bit of undigested potato or something. But here, Jesus, we know that God speaks through Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, and many other passages. And my friend, that doctrine, that teaching is authoritative. It's straight, straightforward. Whether it be salvation, whether it be about worship, authorized worship, whether it be about Christian living, marriage, divorce, remarriage, the second coming, it is from God. And so many people today, oh, well, that's just too difficult. You know, I, I can't understand the Bible. Well, I should say, I can't understand the Bible. You know, some people say that way. But what did Moses say so long ago? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, Moses, when he gave them the law that was a pretty rough play, thing, if you read through it, there's a lot, wonderful thing. But there was a lot to it, 600 and some odd commandments. He says, for this commandment which I command you this day is not too mysterious for you. It is not far off. And brethren, neither is the gospel either. The teachings of Jesus are not far off. We can do it. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. With that in mind, brethren, what is so difficult about the commandment of baptism for remission of sins? I was on that Facebook a couple of months ago and a quote friend of mine that I had vaguely remember where I grew up at that time. He is now a Baptist preacher, which I didn't know at the time, but uh, I was, had some deal on there about baptism on Facebook and he challenged it. And you know what? He could never could, could get past Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth, believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He believeth not shall be condemned. He couldn't get beyond that verse. Oh, he tried mightily. He even brought up an old track, Baptist track about the Church of Christ that was probably written, written back in 1907 or something. I don't know. And brought that up and thought, oh, this is something. And I said, that's all silly. <laughs> but he couldn't get beyond that. What's so difficult about that? My friends, the way to Jesus Christ is not only simple, it's also open to every one of us tonight who would do the Father's will. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest in your, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Brother John knows of that great song. And so it was, I forgot the word. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so it, it, so it's so, or something like that. Well, I had a senior moment there. But anyway, now, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. When Peter stood before those Gentiles that he had never, probably hardly talked to a Gentile in his life. He probably a few times, but after he did, he went and washed his hands or something like that, literally. He opened his mouth before Cornelius and his family and said, In truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God show no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Everyone is accepted if they do the Father's will. My friends, that way of the Lord is 2,000 years old, but it's just as fresh as the day he gave it. Because it's the only way. Yet some come along and they want to add to the Lord. They say, oh, this is a new teaching. 
I read uh, Pentecostal publications once in a while to see what's going on. And you'll see, oh, well, our prophet, prophet so-and-so gave this revelation, you know, the, the next blue moon will, will have a frog in it, and we better all hop around. There are no new teachings in Christianity. If it's, not, if it's newer than 2,000 years, it's not true. Galatians 1 verse 8, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which you would preach in you, let him be accursed. Notice the word there that struck me. And you know, you can read this verse of the Bible a thousand times and still come across something you hadn't noticed. But even if we, who's we? Paul. If Paul or Silas or Timothy or Apollos or Barnabas, if any of them had preached any other gospel than what the Christians had received there in Galatia, they were accursed. My friends, anything else that is not the way, is not the pure gospel, is the devil's doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. And so many do today. My friends, we should never forget the way, the gospel. We should never change it. We should never compromise it. Any part of it. 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgress and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God, but he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If any there come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not to your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So many of our brethren tonight, they want to ride two horses at once, which can't be done successfully they want to appease the devil's doctrine play around with it and stay with the Lord you can't do it my friends what is not the way I'll tell you what's not the way I'm not the way myself you're not the way Billy Graham is not the way David Brown is not the way None of us bore our sins upon the cross. 1 Peter 2 verse 24, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. I'll tell you who else is not the way. Oprah Winfrey is not the way either. Years ago she said, There are many ways to God. I've heard that before. My friends are not, you can start from here and, and head towards... Atlanta, and, and you, you might get there. I don't know where, which way I am. But anyway, you can head that way and you can say, oh, I can get to Atlanta if I go straight. If I go straight both ways, either way I can go get to Atlanta. That's silliness. There's only one way to God, and that's through the Son. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, in whom we are all, whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. One. Not many, but one. And I'll tell you how else who is not the way. Joseph Smith Jr. is not the way either. You know, my friends, 12 million souls are enslaved to Joseph Smith Jr. The Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they call themselves. And yet, Galatians 1 verse 8, even an angel, even if you're 14, what was he, 14 or 16, something like that. If you're 14 years old and the Lord, an angel appears to you and says, oh, I have this new gospel. Woe unto him. It's the devil's gospel. I tell you what is not, not else the way is a Jewish Kabbalist. You may not know what that is. You're better off. <laughs> but, but many people follow that. They have it all figured out. A Catholic priest that lives somewhere and wears sackcloth and ashes and, you know, acts real humble and lowly. He's not the way either. The Pope is not the way. A yoga guru is not the way. A holy man that seems so wonderful is not the way. 
I'm reminded of what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Talks about people like that. Especially I was thinking here about the Catholic Church, the Pope. He says, and when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So many folks, friends, are tied up in following men rather than the Lord. And I'll tell you what else is not the way. Inner healing prayer is not the way either. There's a university north of me that calls himself Lipscomb University. They're going to have a seminar May 16th and 19th called a Formational Prayer Seminar. It costs you 475 bucks, Brother Harold. 475 smackers, as he's calling it. It's going to be headed by Dr. Terry Wardle, formerly of the Ashland Theological Cemetery, I mean Seminary, which is the really headed by the Brethren Church. And let me read what it says about this way they're going to teach up there. A few years ago, they had an Anglican lady priest that came and taught them how to preach. Now they've got a guy from the Brethren Church teach them how to pray. Here's what it says in a little news release. Formerly known as Inner Healing Prayer, Formational Prayer is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. Moving through a Christian caregiver. Bring the healing presence of Jesus Christ into the place of pain and brokenness within a wounded person. Now, yes, there are wounded people out there, but they don't need this gobbledygook, this mysticism 101. That's what that is. Where they concentrate and chant and think of them, and, you know, and, and, and just, they've gone to the Catholic Church for all this and the Orthodox Church and New Age stuff and all sorts of stuff. This is put out, by the way, by the uh, Institute for Christian Spirituality at Lipscomb. Proverbs 28, verse 9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And there surely is an abomination, isn't it? Even his prayer is an abomination. Galatians 2, verse 18 talks about people like this. They're so wrapped up in this mysticism. I had a, I mentioned this, a friend that I went to, Abilene Christian. University many years ago that uh, got involved in stuff like this. He even went to, remember church, went to a, a couple of monasteries and learned how to pray. He'd go in the Bible and got it for free. But it, the other day he left his wife of many, of about 40 years, left his wife for another woman. And I wonder if he got all that from all that chanting and, and stuff they do in that monastery. Colossians 2, verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward through uh, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding, pardon me, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshy mind. Fleshly mind. My friends, that is not the way to the Lord, Jesus Christ. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We can pray to him at any time. Pray through the Son to the Father any time. We don't need to get ourselves in the mood and, and chant and go back and forth. And How silly that is. It's like Brother G.K. Wallace, I read an article many years ago that uh, he was talking about instrumental music, how people say, oh, it makes me feel so good. That's why I love it and all like that. He said, you know, I don't need to go. When I go out to the cemetery and visit my folks' grave, I don't need to play a funeral dirge while I visit their graves so I can remember them the right way. That reminds me of that. Brethren, we don't need faith only salvation either. That's not the way either. Matthew 7 verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall you keep of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We don't need works only salvation either, folks. There are folks that believe in that. And some of our brethren do too. They, they think they can wake their, work their way to heaven by drilling water wells in Africa or feeding the hungry. The social gospel. What is our righteousness 
so-called in God's sight by works. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's how our works that are not based on faith works only salvation. Now, where is the way to the Father? Only through the Son, Jesus Christ the righteous. John 10, verse 9 and 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not because to, except to steal, to kill, to destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus Christ, the way to the Father, only for those who have been united with him and remained in his grace. My friends, have you been united, united with him? Have you remained faithful to him? Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as the Father, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. What about you tonight? Do you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, or do you follow yourself, or the traditions of men, or your emotions? Anything but the gospel. I thank you very much.